Good morning, everyone. Well, to standing room only last week and a small crowd this week, welcome to summer. People away and, and guests here, so it's nice to have folks who are from what you told me, but I forgot already. Pennsylvania, Alberta, and of course, Terry, you're California, but I think it's uh, California, Cape Breton, right? Or Cape Breton, California. Is there such a place in, in California? Well, let's stand and sing together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of all Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King of this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations? With truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place that you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who I slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would let down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Lord, do you want to open in prayer? Sure.
in this time of desperation when all we know is doubt and fear there is only one foundation we believe we believe we believe in God the Father we believe in Jesus Christ we believe in the Holy Spirit and he's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion we believe that he conquered death we believe in the resurrection and he's coming back again we believe in this broken generation when all is dark you help us see there is only one salvation we believe we believe we believe in god the father we believe in Jesus Christ We believe in the Holy Spirit And He's given us new life We believe in the crucifixion We believe that He conquered death We believe in the resurrection And He's coming back again We believe We believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life, we believe in the resurrection, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection And He's coming back again So let the lost be found and the dead be raised In the here and now let love invade Let the church live loud our God will say We believe, we believe And the gates of hell will not prevail For the power of God has torn the veil now we know your love will never fail We believe, we believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ We believe in the Holy Spirit And He's given us new life We believe in the crucifixion We believe that He conquered death We believe the resurrection and he's coming back he's coming back again thank you Lord thank you Jesus oh, what a wonderful Savior it's a, a glorious thing to know Christ and to be able to walk with him but who are you and who am I that we could be we could belong to Jesus I mean what have we ever done to deserve such amazing grace from Him? Lord of all the earth 
We care to know my name. We care to feel my hurt. Who am I at the bright and morning star? We choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart. Not because of who I am. But because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are, I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. You told me who I am. I am yours. Who am I? The eyes that see my sin. But look on me with love. And watch me rise again. Who am I, the voice that comes to see, who call out through the rain, come the storm in me, not because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Flower quickly fading here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, vapor in the wind. Still, you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. You told me who I am. I am yours. We're quickly fading here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, vapor in the winds. Still, you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. You told me who I am. I am your. I am yours. Well, we can ask ourselves who we are, but we need to ask really who Jesus is. Who is this one who was born long ago in a stable? Who is this one that has changed the world and changes hearts and lives in such powerful ways? Who is he who was born in a stable long ago where men came before him and bowed low? Where a virgin gave birth to a tiny little child who was destined to change the whole world? Who is he? Who is he? He's the Savior of the world, the Son of God. He's the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the one to whom all will someday bow. Who is he on a hill while the multitudes are still as he speaks of God, truth, and love? Never man spoke like him with the power of his words he reached deep into the hearts of them all who is he healing sick and raising up the dead and giving 
sight to the blind Who is he at a tomb Where a man was four days dead With a word he brought him back to life Who is he? Who is he? Who is he? He's the Savior of the world The Son of God He's the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the one to whom all will someday bow. Who is he on his face in a garden weeping there, crying, Father, please take this cup. But there was no other way for our souls to save, not my will. But your will for me, O oh God Who is he on a hill Hung between the earth and sky On a cross with his life blood flowing down Hear him say, Father, forgive For they know not what they do It is finished was his final victory cry Who is he? Who is, he? Who is he? He's the Savior of the world, the Son of God. He's the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the one to whom all will someday bow. Who is he whom they laid in a stone-cold tomb, risen by the power of Conquered death, sin and hell And risen up on high To return to judge and rule for all Who is he? Who is he? He's the Savior of the world The Son of God He's the Lord Jesus Christ King of kings and Lord of lords He's the one to whom all will someday bow. Who is he? Who is he? He is the Savior of the world, the Son of God. He's the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the one to whom all will someday bow. Lord, I want to thank you and praise you tonight, this morning, Lord, that we could be together by the grace of God, that we could know what it is to know you and to love you and serve you, Lord, and that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that, Lord, you have all authority in heaven and on earth. And when we trust in you, that you never let go. You never let go of your own, Lord. You hold on to them. You take them through the fire. You take them through the flood. You bring them all the way home. I just praise you for that reality, Lord. I just give you thanks. Jesus, you never let go. Even though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught, in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no evil For my God is with me And if my God is with me Whom then shall I fear? Then shall I be? Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. And I can see a light that is coming. For the heart that holds on, a glory. 
glorious night beyond all compare and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes we'll live to know you here on the earth and i will fear no never let go in every high and every low oh no you never let go lord you never let go of me and i can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes Still I will praise you, still I will praise you, oh no, you never let go, through the calm and through the storm, oh no, you never let go, in every high and every low, oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. so true friends it's so wonderful to have a God who never lets go of us a God that we can say he's my Lord he's my Savior that he can take you through it all and how wonderful it is no matter how deep the valley no matter how hard the way it's wonderful to have Jesus holding your hand to be the Good Shepherd I've had many tears and sorrows I've had questions for tomorrow There have been times I didn't know right from wrong But in every situation God gave blessed consolation That my trials come to only make me strong through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Oh, I have learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. been to lots of places you know I've seen a lot of faces there have been times I felt so all alone but in those lonely hours yes those precious lonely hours Jesus let me know that I was his own through it all through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus I have learned to trust in God Through it all Through it all I've learned to depend upon His Word So I thank God for the mountains And I thank Him for the valleys I thank Him for the storms He's brought me through For if I'd never had a problem Never know my God could solve them Never know what faith in God could do Through it all through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus Oh, I have learned to trust in God Through it all Through 
through it all I've learned to depend upon His Word Well, it's time for a puppet show. Good morning, everybody. Hey, it's a beautiful day. Lots of green grass around, and I'm waiting for Lammy to come, but I don't know quite where she's at. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Whoa, look what I got. Well, Lammy, you got a, a flower. Yeah, it's a beautiful flower. I just picked it this morning. Well, that's wonderful. What are you going to do with it? Well, I am going to, I'm going to put water on top of it, and I'm going to make it grow, and it's going to grow into a big, big, like maybe almost a tree. Uh, Lammy? Oh, and, and, and I'm gonna, it's going to be my best friend for a long, 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 long time. I love it. Do you, do you like the beautiful purple flowers? I think they're wonderful, yes. But um, I don't think you're going to have it around that long. Well, why not? Look at it. It's perfect. And if I just keep watering it and hugging it and kissing it, then it's going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I don't think so. Well, why not? Does anybody know why? How come it's not going to keep growing? No roots. It's got no roots. It's not in the ground. Oh, that's okay. I'll just stick it in the ground. Nope, it's got no roots. You mean it's not going to last for very long? Not very long at all. You know, in the Bible it talks about a grapevine. Yeah, so? Well, a grapevine, it says that it has to be attached to the, to the root. It has to be, it has to grow. If it's detached from it, it just withers up and poof, it's gone. You mean this flower's not going to last very long? Not very long. Oh, it was my favorite flower. Let me help you with that. There you go. It was my favorite flower. Well, you enjoy it while you have it, but it has to have roots to grow. And that's just like people, they need roots to grow. Are uh, you going to plant some people in the ground? <laughs> no, silly. No, it's not, that's not the way it works. But if you have Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says we can be rooted in Him and we can be grounded in Him, that Jesus will help us to grow. If we're attached to Jesus, we're going to grow and we're going to be able to live and come further and further in a good walk with God. Oh, so I guess if I had left it in the ground, it would stay longer. Yep. But flowers come and flowers go. But if you have Jesus in your life, you will live forever. How can you live forever? I think everybody dies. Yes, but the soul in people never die. And they will live forever because they trust in Jesus. But in the meantime, we can enjoy the flower. Oh, okay. Well, that sounds awesome. I'm going to take this flower with me. Everywhere I go until it gets all faded. But right now, it's so beautiful. It is very beautiful. Did you smell it yet? Well, to tell you the truth, I love lots of grasses, but that particular flower I'm allergic to. You're allergic to it? What does that mean? <laughs> it means if I get close to it, I sneeze. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. Okay, well, I'll keep my distance with it. But you don't mind looking at it. Oh, no, I think it's very beautiful. But I have to stay this far away, because if I get close, I'm in trouble. Okay, well, hey, you going to the barn? I sure am. Got some milk? I sure do. You want to come and get some? Yes, I do. Okay, bring the flower along and we'll go. All righty. Okay. Oh, oh, hey, 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 back off a little. Oh, all right then. Oh, oh. <laughs> well... Well, Miss Flower, I'll keep you for a little while anyway. Let's sing a little children's song this morning. Does somebody want to hold this up for me? 
Alan? Okay. There we go. Start with this one, and then flip it over to the other side. This is Jesus Loves the Little Children of the World. Of the world. Okay. Let's sing this little song together. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of Shetty Camp. Girls and boys, both big and small, Jesus loves them one and all. Jesus loves the little children of Shetty Camp. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Thank you, Alan. Without Him, I can do nothing. Without Him, I'd surely fail. Without Him, I would be drifting like a ship without Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, do you know him today? Please don't turn him away. Oh, Jesus, my Jesus, without him, him I would be dying without him I'd feel enslaved without him life would be worthless but with Jesus thank God I'm saved, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today, please don't turn him away, oh Jesus, my Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be. Jesus said in John chapter 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Let's go back to the first one. So here's the Lord Jesus after giving us the incredible discourse on that he was the way, that he was the truth, that he was the life, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14 uh, gives to us all that we need, that he brings us into a, a unity with the, with the Trinity, God. Amazing realities that God would come to us in the person of, of his son Jesus Christ and then send us the Holy Spirit and when we look at that in John 14 we see the fullness of the provision of God and the, the reality is if you don't have Christ you don't have that fullness and people are living so empty in this world that they're going from one thing to the next to try to find some kind of satisfaction and all the while the Lord is offering us his fullness incredible fullness 
And so often people go down bypath meadows. People who are not believers, of course, they try everything to find that kind of satisfaction. And in my early years, I spent my life trying to find anything and everything that would bring some kind of a, a, a meaning and a purpose to my life. And I discovered there was none without Christ. But finding Christ changed everything. As I entered into a relationship with him, I discovered that his provision was so incredible and so amazing. And now as his disciples were about to see their Lord crucified and, 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 and uh, buried, uh, it was a shocking time for them. But Jesus be keeps on giving them words of assurance over and over and over again. And here he gives this this little statements of security and also somewhat of a challenge for us. And the challenge that he gives to them, we will find as we go through this passage. But what he begins to address, he says, listen, I'm the true vine. You see, even in the Old Testament, Israel was likened to the vine because the presence of God was to be among them. And... Uh, um, that was a common theme in the Old Testament. But now Jesus comes out with this word. He says, listen, the real vine, the real answer is me. The Jews had come to the point where they said, because we're Jews, because we belong to Israel, we're it. And you can see that in the challenges that happened. Don't you remember what happened when, when Jesus was pointing to himself as the answer? And, he, and they said, well, we're Abraham's children. We were never in slavery to, any, slavery to anybody. And Jesus said, no, no, no. You're of your father, the devil, because the works of the devil you're doing. You're clinging to your ancestry, and I'm telling you, you need to cling to me. It's the God of your ancestors that make the difference in the Old Testament, and it's the God of the world, the creator of all things, that's the answer for Jew and Gentile alike. Praise God that Jesus is the true vine. If you're looking for true source, for true life, it's in Christ himself. And you have to remember that this was just post-communion where he had given them the bread and the cup. And he was telling them, you know, you need me. You need my sacrifice, my, you know, my blood shed for you. And he called it the fruit of the vine. And now he says, by the way, I'm the true vine. So he was making sure they understood taking that communion is not the vine of life. It's not where life is going to come from, the fruit of the grape. It's going to come from me because I'm the true vine. It's me. He points to himself and rightly so because he was the son of God. He had every right to point to himself and to point the world to himself. And the Holy Spirit made sure that we were here today to be able to hear Jesus say these words, I am the true vine. Friends, wherever you go, no matter where you go in all of the planet, there's only one true vine, true source of life, and it is Jesus Christ himself. He goes on to say something here. He says, and my father is the vine dresser. Now, a vine dresser, I don't know if anybody here grows grapes. Does anybody here grow grapes? Ah, Alan grows some grapes. Have you grown some grapes? Well, a vine dresser is somebody who takes care of the vines, right? And uh, Alan, have you ever been called a vine dresser? No. Okay, well, there they go. <laughs> and what about you, Elsie? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jesus says, I'm the true vine, and my father's the vine dresser. So he gives a little bit of a picture of a vineyard, and he says there's one true vine in the vineyard. All the other ones are just temporary, but this is the real one. This is the real McCoy. This is the one that is a spiritual vine. And this spiritual vine is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And the Father is the one who's doing the vine dressing. Now, when we think about that, what would the Father have to do with Jesus? Could he improve on Christ? Could he? No, not at all. But then Jesus begins to explain what he's getting at. Remember, he's using a physical picture in an agrarian society where, where vines and grapes were everywhere. He was using this picture to explain how it worked between him and his disciples, you and me. 
how it worked with the apostles. So, so they would know, they would have an understanding of how it is that they were to live as a Christian. And he says this, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So he gives this picture of the vine dresser. The father is looking at the vine. Jesus says, I'm the vine. But then he says something. He explains it a little further and he says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. So when it comes to branches, I'm going to get there in a second. Okay, go to the next one after that. Yeah, where he says it. Okay. Uh, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch can't bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. So you can go back up again. I'm the vine, he says, you're the branches. So when he says, I'm the true vine, what's he referring to? And how can there be a distinction between the vine and the branches? Okay, the vine. What does the vine include, by the way? It's the source of life, okay. It includes the roots. It includes the, the stem. And does it include the branches? It does, right? Jesus says, I'm the true vine. And he said, you're the branches. So now he's speaking to his own, right? He's not telling the world everybody's part of the branch. But he's telling them, you're part of the vine. You're part of me now. I've invited you in. And not that you become God by any means, no. But to understand, just like the picture that he used when he said that he was, the, in, in Paul writes in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 12, he says that we are the body of Christ. Isn't that what he says? We are part of Christ. And he is, of course, the, the head of and we're the members of his body. Well, he's the vine and we're the branches. But then as he says the father is the vine dresser, there is no need of improvement on Jesus Christ. He's the perfect vine. But there's a need of improvement here, isn't there? There's need of growth here. What do you grow vines for? This is an easy answer. For fruit. I mean, who would grow a whole fields of grapevines if there was no fruit on them? Nobody. You're looking for grapes. You're looking for fruit. You're looking for results. And the Lord Jesus says, I'm the vine and I'm producing fruit. Praise God, he does. He produces fruit. But he produces fruit through the, through the branches. And if we're the branches, then we are expected to bear fruit. Now, when he speaks of this, he says, first of all, there are dead branches. Branches that are not connected. They may look like they're connected. You could look at them all day long and there'd be no fruit on them. I grew up in Southwest Marguerite and there's an apple tree around every corner. And they're all wild apples, by the way. But I know the good ones. And I try to get there before when I used to have 30, 40 head of cattle. I used to try to make sure I got there before the cows did because they'd eat them all. And they'd get drunk on them too. And by the way, when they get drunk, they busted through fences. They went everywhere. And when they smelled apples, look out. So, uh, yeah. But I, we used to go and there were certain trees. We knew exactly where they were. And we tried to get them early and, and, and get all those apples, all those apples picked because uh, they were bearing fruit. And some of them were bore good fruit, some of them didn't. But often on those trees, there would be a big, you know, dry stick. You know, no, not even a, a, a bark on the, on, the, on, the, on the stick. You didn't look for fruit on that. Would you get fruit on that? No. Not possible. Because it's dead. And so he gives the picture here. He says, every branch of me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes it away. He's going to explain that taken away later. And so in the so overall Christian church, there are many people who are believers in Jesus Christ. And there are many who say they are believers in Christ, but there's no fruit. There's no change in their life. And if people think that they can live any way they want with no fruit, and we're going to talk about what that fruit is, 
uh, then they're fooling themselves. They're dead. And what will happen is that they'll be just taken away. They don't belong to the, to the vine. They have no place there because they're dead. But every branch in me that uh, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So a good vine dresser will do a lot of chopping, even on the good vines. The dead ones, they cut off and throw it away. But the good vines they will still do a lot of pruning. And I can tell you this, friends. If you belong to Jesus Christ, he's going to prune you. And you might not like the pruning. He's going to prune you so that you'll bear more fruit. He's going to deal with you. He's going to discipline you when you go astray. He's going to do some, some cutting and whatever needs to be done in order to make you walk with God. And some of it will be painful. I mean, if, if I saw somebody, you know, dressing a vine and cutting away, and apparently that's what happens in a vineyard when they decide they want to get the vines all trimmed up, they don't just cut off the dead stuff. They're ruthless, and they cut, and they cut, and they cut, and there's all kind of greenery on the ground, and it looks like, oh, man, you butchered that vine. But in the end of it, there's a lot more fruit that comes from it because it's pruned. And that's what God will do in your life. The Father will prune you. He will bring circumstances into your life to try you, to test you, to bring you to the end of yourself. When he sees you going astray, he will do what? What does the Psalm 23 says he will do? He restores my soul. He will do whatever needs to be done in your life to bring you back or to bring you even further that there might be more fruit in your life. You know... What is the object of our lives? For us, most of the time, the object is that we can live as peaceful, as happy, and as a trouble-free life as possible. Isn't that what we would like? Isn't that what we kind of strive for? And sadly, sometimes Christian preachers go off on these tangents and try to tell you, you know, you're going to have wealth, health, and happiness if you follow Jesus. Well, they're liars. It's not true. You're going to have trouble if you follow Jesus. You're going to be pruned if you follow Jesus. You're going to be disciplined if you follow Jesus. That doesn't mean you're not going to have joy. He promised deep joy. But many people think, they, they may make a mistake. They think that all God wants you to do is to be happy. No, he wants you to have real joy. And real joy will find its place in the deepest sorrows, in the greatest trials, wherever it, whatever it is. Yes, sometimes things go smoothly, but sometimes we're in a sinking boat and we don't know what to do. But Jesus promised us his joy. He promised us his peace. He promised us the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And he will do whatever he needs to do to make you holy. Someone has said God is more interested in your holiness than your happiness. And we are more interested in our happiness than our holiness. But God is more interested in holiness because he knows that holiness produces real deep joy. Happiness is, can be very fleeting. You can have the greatest thrill as you get on the roller coaster and you flip three or four or five times. Um, but, you know, you got to get off of that. And you got to go on with life. And, you know, sometimes you, by the time you get off of it, you're not happy any longer. <laughs> you're losing what your lunch. So, you know, temporary happinesses are just that. But deep joy that lasts and takes you through the deepest trials and brings you up the other side, that's something different. Look at the apostles, what kind of life they had. Look at the life of the apostle Paul. He said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. He was beaten and tortured and shipwrecked and, and stoned and everything else. And actually, Jesus said that. He said, in this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So God will prune you. He will discipline you. He will do things that need to be done in your life out of love and out of grace and out of mercy to develop your character. Because can you tell me, when he talks about fruit, what is the fruit that God wants to see from your life. Anybody? Does anybody know what it might be? Okay, that, that's called fruit as well. The Apostle Paul spoke about the, the people that were saved as that they were fruit. Any, anybody else? The character of Christ Jesus in us? Yes, that's true. 
And in the book of Galatians, he talks about the fruit of the? The Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, self-control. These are the fruit. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And I'll tell you what, it's not the fruit of Pierre Chasson, nor is it the fruit of anybody here. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And it's a different love, it's different joy, it's different peace than what the world offers. It's different. It's real. It's lasting. It's deep. It changes your character so that you become more loving. You become more forgiving so that you can turn the other cheek. <coughs> so that you can uh, have a genuine, heartfelt care for people. People that you see, broken people. It takes away pride it takes away all that the works of the flesh are, which the Bible describes as well. And that's what God wants to bring into our lives, the fruit of the Spirit. And he will do whatever he needs to do to make that happen in your experience. As what happens is, we begin to know what it is to die to self and trust the Spirit of God to live in us. And as we do, then this fruit begins to come. And in that process, sometimes we're afflicted. Sometimes we go through hard times. The Apostle Paul wrote about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And he said, we're, we're afflicted. We're pressed down. We're all these things. But he said, we're standing. We're still moving forward. We're okay. Why? Because the life of Christ is being revealed in us while, while the, uh, the uh, pressures that come against us. So he says it this way. He says, we who, are, who are live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be revealed in us, in our mortal flesh. So death is working in us, but life in you. Why would he say death is working in us? It's because he said this, we are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Carrying about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, the life of Jesus would be revealed in our body. But previous to this, this is what he says. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. So the excellency of the powers of God, and it's not of us. Christ being revealed in us. Christ's character. Christ's love. Christ's peace, all these things, the peace, the joy, all the things that the fruit of the Spirit brings to us comes through Jesus Christ and as we rely upon him, as we discover that he is our peace, that he is our goodness, he is our life, that everything that is good, everything that is holy is coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why he says we need to walk in the spirit so we don't feel the lust of the, fulfill the lust of the flesh. And all of the things that the flesh produces, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, which is the deception of the mind through the use of drugs, by the way. That's what sorcery was in the, Old Test in the New Testament. It comes from the Greek word pharmakia, which we get our word pharmacy from. But the Ill illegitimate use of drugs was called sorcery in the Old Testament. Uh, that's why you think, you know, witches, brews, and po potions, and all of that. It was drugs that was being used, and it's still drugs that are being used today. This is the work of the flesh. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, and revelries. All these kinds of things. But the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. <coughs> That's what God wants to produce in your life. So is he going to allow trials in your life? Absolutely. Because he's dressing the vine. He's pruning you so that you might bear fruit. That's his passion. And so he bears every fruit. Go back again just for a second. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that bears fruit, he prunes. And he, you bear fruit, every Christian bears fruit. If there's no fruit at all, you are never a believer. You're dead. You're a dead branch. But if, you, if you're a Christian, there has to be some fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. But there's got to be some fruit. But his passion for you is that you bear more fruit. 
that you more of the fruit of the Spirit is being revealed in your life, that you're more effective in reaching people in the kingdom of God. And so he wants you to bear more fruit. That's encouraging, isn't it? He wants you to grow in these things. In other words, through the day, you know, maybe you're loving and kind, uh, you know, to your children in the morning, but maybe after the end of a day when you've worked long and hard and, and they're screaming and hollering, you kind of lose it. You know, I know that's probably never happened with any of you people here. But, uh, you know, the Spirit of God can enable you not to lose it, but to still be loving and kind and gentle. That doesn't mean you don't deal with the situations. I, I'm not saying that. But you don't have to live a life of losing it. You can grow. You don't have to be under the control of the f works of the flesh, which is all these things, contentions, outbursts of anger. That's the flesh. It's not the spirit. It never is. Uh, all the things that are listed there. The spirit of God wants to transform each one of us to be more like Christ. Now, if we're not a Christian, all we're going to produce is rotten fruit. It will be the consistent mark of your life to produce rotten fruit. And you can know the Bible and there are thousands of people and thousands of churches where lots of people know the Bible. They quote the Bible, but there's no fruit. Well, if there's no fruit, the Bible says examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And because it's impossible for your flesh to produce fruit. It can't. You can't train your flesh to serve God. You have a sinful nature within you that's bent to go in the wrong direction. It always will be, and it will never be reconciled to God. And what people are trying to do is say, well, I want to be a good Christian, so I'm going to try my hardest to be a good Christian, and they find it an utter failure, and they can't understand why. Here's why. Because you can't do this. It has to be the fruit of the Spirit. It has to be God doing something in you. And that is the, the, the answer to Christianity. This idea, and it has prolific, become prolific throughout Christendom that God calls you saves you and now he just wants to help you to do the best you can is just a, a, a farce it's a lie it's a lie from the pit of hell because you can't live the Christian life and the more you try to do it the more you'll find out what a failure I am so where's the answer the answer is I need to find my source in the vine I can't do this. It has to be God that does it. You see, a branch that's yielded to the vine, that is getting all of its life from the vine, gets everything that it needs in order to produce fruit. Apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. God's passion is for you to be fruit bearers. So when it comes to pruning, uh, this is a quote from Wearsby. He says, pruning doesn't simply mean spiritual surgery that removes what is bad. It can also mean cutting away the good and the better so we might enjoy the best. See, sometimes, you know, God takes away things from us that he might get, bring something better into your life. And sometimes we're content with far less. You see, as I said earlier, God is more interested in your holiness than your happiness. And someone sent something to me this morning, if I can find it here. It was a, a, a wonderful statement. It was made by G.W. Watson. He lived from 1845 to 1924. He said this, If God's called you to be really like Jesus, he will draw you into a life of crucifixion and humility and put upon you such demands of obedience, you'll not be able to follow other people, measure yourself by other Christians, and in many ways he will seem to let other people do things which he will not let you do. Other Christians and ministers who seem very religious and useful may push themselves, pull wires, work schemes, and carry out their plans, but you cannot do it. And if you attempt it, you will meet with such failure and rebuke from the Lord as to make you surely penitent. Others may boast of themselves, of their work, of their successes, of their writings, but the Holy Spirit will not allow you to do any such thing, and if you begin it, he'll lead you into some deep mortification that will make you despise yourself and all your good works. 
Others may be allowed to succeed in making money or have a legacy left to them, but it's likely God will keep you poor because he wants you to have something far better than gold, namely a helpless dependence upon him that he may have the privilege of supplying your needs day by day out of an unseen treasury. The Lord may let others be honored and put forward and keep you hidden in obscurity because he wants to produce some choice fragrant fruit for his coming glory, which can only be produced in the shade. He may let others be great, but keep you small. He may let others do a work for him and get the credit for it, but he will make you work and toil without knowing how much you're doing. And then to make your work still more precious, he may let others get credit for the work which you have done and thus make your reward 10 times greater when Jesus comes. The Holy Spirit will put a strict watch over you with a jealous love, We rebuke you for little words and feelings or for wasting your time, which other Christians never feel distressed over. So make up your mind that God is an infinitely sovereign being and has a right to do as he pleases with his own. He may not explain to you a thousand things which puzzle your reason in his dealings with you, but if you absolutely sell yourself to be his love slave, he will wrap you up in jealous love and bestow upon you many blessings which come only to those who are willing to be in the inner circle. Settle it forever. Then that you are to deal directly with the Holy Spirit and he is to have the privilege of tying your tongue or chaining your hand or closing your eyes in ways he does not seem to do with others. Now when you are so possessed with the living God that you are in your secret heart, pleased and delighted over this peculiar, private, jealous guardianship and management of the Holy Spirit over your life, then you will have found the dwelling place of heaven, the vestibule of heaven. This was George Douglas Watson, a Wesleyan minister from Los Angeles. Yes, my friends, God knows what he's doing. And often we will choose the lesser, the, the lesser path instead of the higher goal. Often we will choose to walk as the world walks and look for some blessing from God in our lives, a little trinkets here and there. And all the while, the promises of God are abundance. Their abundance, but not the abundance of the world, but the abundance of the Spirit of God, the presence of God that would cause you to want to tarry in His presence. Friends, this is often reflected in how we live. Is prayer precious to you? Are you called to the place of prayer where you long to be there and spend not just five minutes, but hours in the presence of God? Or have we moved so far away from real Christianity and a real deep walk with God that we settle for crumbs when God has prepared a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies? Where are we? And where could we be? And may God create a longing in your heart to say, Lord, prune me. Lord, do whatever you want with me. God, take me. I'm yours. And take me up down the paths that you want whether they're whether they're paths that look glorious or whether they look mundane because the Lord Jesus Christ can be so present in the mundane things of life and meanwhile we can be living the most exciting life that this world has to offer and have nothing of God oh friends don't miss real Christianity discover what it is to know this wonderful reality that God does these things in us. Now, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The truth, the truth will set you free. The word that he's spoken to them of the forgiveness of God, the, the mercy of God, the coming to Christ and trusting in him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Words that were spoken like John three sixteen, which somehow has lost a lot of its meaning to the world and to the church. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes trusts in him. And do we think for a moment that this word of trusting in Jesus is just a one-time flash in the pan? Oh, yes, I trust in Jesus to be my savior. The whole Christian life is meant to be a life of trust. It's meant to be a life of dependence. It's what God calls us to. And it's a life, it's the only kind of life there is, to live in constant dependence upon Christ. Continue believing. Remember when Jesus said in John chapter 7, as he speaks about the Spirit, if anybody's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he challenges them. He says, whoever uh, believes in me, out of his inmost being will flow rivers of living water. And he spoke of the Spirit, which was not yet given. 
But now the Holy Spirit's been given. Now I can drink. But here's the tense that's given in that. He didn't say, let him come to me and have one drink. What the tense of the verb is this, let him continually come to me and drink. Keep on drinking. You have no supply of your own. How could it be? He said, whoever, that out of, if whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, have a wellspring of water drink, uh, springing up into everlasting life. And he says, they will never thirst. How can that be? The only way of never thirst is to be constantly supplied. That's the only way. But if you're walking through the desert of life and you have no supply and you're thirsty and you can't seem to be filled, then you need to take a good look at Jesus, friends, a fresh look and realize, I've got to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I need genuine Christianity lived out in my life. Without it, I have nothing. Abide in me. And here's the word that he uses, abide. This word is used, I think, 16 or 17 times in the next uh, little sections here. Abide in me. It means remain in me. It means cling to me. It means rest in me. Okay? Abide in me. And I in you. There isn't any problem on God's side. Abide in me. Remain in me. As the branch can't bear fruit of itself... Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now he brings a personal challenge. Yes, he's the vine. We're the branches. We're attached to him. Hallelujah. But then he says, now I want you to remain with me. I want you to stick with me. You think you're going to bear any fruit apart from me? Are you going to live in an independent life of me and then try to pull Jesus in when you need him? Or have a little Jesus here and there? A little Jesus in church? You remember I told you the story of a lady who came to me one time and she said to me, I don't understand it. She said, when I'm in church praising God, oh, I'm worshiping him. I'm, I'm in heaven with the Lord. It's just wonderful. I, it's a wonderful experience. She said, I'm dancing in the spirit. It's just amazing. But she said, all week long, I hate my husband and I hate my kids. I can't stand them. But at least I have an hour or two on Sunday where I'm praising the Lord. And I had to tell her, I said, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but you don't have any hour or two praising God. That's not real. You may have some emotional experiences, but that's not the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God produces the fruit of the Spirit. And if there's no fruit, there's nothing. It's fake. It's not real. She wasn't very happy with me. But I explained it to her. This is what God's word says. You need to take, you need a real reset here. You're not walking in the spirit. And there's no way that you're going to walk in the spirit, in the flesh, all week long. And then for a couple of hours, you're going to be praising God. You cannot hate your family and love God at the same time. Friends, we cannot live this duplicity. And that might be an extreme example, but I think all of us can relate to it. Can we not? Have we all not been there? I've been there as a Christian. I know what it is to walk in the flesh. And it's ugly. It's there's nothing good in it. In my flesh dwells no good thing, said the Apostle Paul. He didn't say, when I, before I was a believer, in my flesh dwelled no good thing. He's saying, in my flesh now dwells no good thing. And boy, you're not long discovering it. And my friends, once you begin to understand what it is to walk in the Spirit, when you walk in the flesh, at least you know what's going on. You're not going to blame, ah, look, all these circumstances. You can't understand. You know, anybody would, would react this way. Don't make excuses for your sin or you'll never be free. Here's the reality. If I'm walking in the flesh, it's because I'm walking in the flesh. If I'm walking in the Spirit, it's because I'm walking in the Spirit. And when I know that I'm not walking in the Spirit, I should know it right away. I should know how serious it is. May God give us grace. So he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Not just fruit, but much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, if, you, if that's not where you are, your cast of the branches withered and they gather them and throw them in the fire and they're burned. There's nothing there. There's no life there. It's just, there's nothing there. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, 
you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. We saw this promise last time. We saw this great promise. It's, it's, so, it's, it's an amazing promise. Ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. I've already said, don't get the wrong impression from false teachers who grab a verse like this and tell you that whatever you desire, you just ask God and you're going to get it. Without the condition that you are abiding in the vine. Without the condition that Christ is ruling in your heart. Because without that condition, this promise doesn't work. You see, if you trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding, then you'll find out that God will give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because the desires of your heart will be His desires. It's His desires that become your desires when you are walking in the Spirit, when you are trusting Jesus. And then you will discover the power of answered prayer. How, why is prayer so powerless? Often it is because we are not praying in the Spirit. We are not praying in the will of God. And we are not abiding as we should. We are not resting in the person, power, and the presence of Jesus. And then he says, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. So we have fruit, we have more fruit, we have much fruit, all of this. And what he begins to do now in this section, and I haven't got much time left here today, he speaks about love. And this is where I want, it, want you to understand this. The bonds that are in the vine, the, uh, uh, the relationship, while God has all that is needed to produce the grapes and the, 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 the sunshine, the water, the everything that is needed, all wrapped up and all welded together in all of this is the incredible love of God. It is God's passionate love for you that will prune you, that will discipline you, that will hold you, that will get you through, that will give you all that you need for life and for godliness. It's because of his love. As the Father loved me, also I have loved you. Abide in my love. When he says abide in me, you know, some people might think, well, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, you're God. I guess we got to. But no, it's abide in my love. God loves you. And does he want the best for you? Absolutely. How many children often will balk against their parents because the parent won't let the child do what they want? Isn't that the huge challenge of being a parent? especially as they get a little older and they know absolutely everything by the time they're 13 years old and you know nothing at all. They're like, well, my parents are like walking zombies. They don't know anything. What is going on there? It's because a parent loves their child. They will tell them the right thing. They will challenge them to do the right thing. They will discipline them. They will do... Real love is not do whatever you want because I love you. If that was the case, then send your children out to play on the yellow line. It's pretty. <laughs> that wouldn't be love, would it? No. no. Real love does something different. Love does whatever it needs to be done in order to fashion you. And you know, we sang a little song earlier, Jesus loves the little children. You're all a bunch of children. All of us are. We are so children that in reality we all should be wearing diapers this morning, right? And sucking on a bottle. That's how infant we really are. And how much we need the tender care of God. So I want to challenge you today to understand that this is wrapped up in the love of God. This is not some cold, hard, calculated direction for you. This is not some killjoy at work. This is a father who loves his children. And if you will humble yourself as a little child, that's the only way you get in the kingdom of God. And let me tell you something, it's the only way to live in the kingdom of God. You're no giant and neither am I. We are children. And we have so much to learn. And if you lived with Christ for 50 and 60 years, and I, I'm not there, I've been maybe 40 years, 40, yeah, around 40 years, I've lived with Christ. 
And in those 40 years, I may have grown some, but oh, it's so little compared to what there is. Because this is God. We are infants. You know, we're really just inside the egg. We haven't even been hatched yet. You know, a chicken in an egg may think they know a lot. Oh, look, I know, I know where the boundaries are inside my egg. I can bounce from this side to that side to that side, swim around. I can do backflips. Whoa, I'm pretty well something, right? But once that chick comes out of the egg, whoa, that's a whole different world. <laughs> what they knew in the egg is no good anymore. And the little that we think we know here is, is nothing compared to what there is for heaven itself. I admit being a Christian... There is a whole new life, isn't there? But then there's a whole new life coming, friends, deeper and richer than we, ever, we could ever imagine. Can you go to the next one? Or is that it? If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. As I've kept my Father's commandments, abide in his love. Abide, abide, abide. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain with you, and your joy may be full. This is my commandment. You love one another as I have loved you. It's full of love. Full of love. And yes, does God have the right to give commandments? Of course. Does parents have a right to give commandments? Of course they do. Because it's in a, in a position of love. We know there's abuse of parents around. We know that. But Jesus is not one. God is not one. The Father is not one. The Holy Spirit is not one of those. He is fully for you and with you. So when you're challenged, when you're challenged about living in sin, when you're challenged, sometimes by a fellow believer, or by the Spirit of God, as you open the Word of God and say, no, you can't do this. This is wrong then take it from the Lord. Don't fool around with it. Run from sin. Turn from it. And turn to the Lord. Or your spiritual life will go in the toilet. You need to abide, remain with Christ. This is God's call on your life. He's the vine and we're the branches. May the Spirit of God touch each one of us and, and, and draws nearer even today. May you know what it is to be surrendered. And for, if anybody's listening to this, whether on radio, TV, or internet, or here, if you've not yet trusted in Christ, God loves you. And when he calls you to turn from sin and turn to him, he's calling you out of pure, passionate love to rescue you from darkness and bring you into his marvelous light. Let's pray. Thank you for the word of God today, Lord. Thank you for its truth. And thank you, Lord, for your spirit's presence, Lord, to touch us and call us, Lord. We know, Lord, that you do love us. Give us surrendered hearts. Do something deeper in all of our hearts. And may we know what it is to walk in the spirit this week, to abide in you that we might bear fruit, that we might bear much fruit, and that we might bear more fruit, and that we might be glorified in it all. And Lord, we will never regret a moment that has been surrendered totally to you. Take us there, O God, and keep us there by the grace of God. In Jesus' name, amen.